World War I, it was the Great War, the war to end all wars. But was it inevitable, as many have argued? Did Germany pose such a threat that Britain had no choice but to send millions to fight and die? In a controversial new book, Oxford historian Neil Ferguson argues that the war was nothing less than the single greatest mistake in modern history. It's called the pity of war. In your book, you challenge the dominant thinking about uh, the First World War, thinking that's been embraced by most historians. I mean, at the very start, I mean, you claim that, that World War I may be the single biggest mistake in history, and that, in fact, it was Britain, not Germany, that was responsible for escalating a, a continental into a world war. What's your evidence for that conclusion? Well, the evidence really uh, comes from two main areas. Um, one is, of course, uh, the evidence relating to German policy and German objectives. Uh, and the other is the evidence uh, relating to, to Britain's decision. And one of the most important points I try to make in, in The Pity of War is that uh, there isn't a necessary connection between the German decision uh, to risk a war on the continent, uh, which is mainly directed against Russia when you look at the documents, hmm. And the British decision to intervene, um, that that decision is a very last minute decision on the part of the British government. It's very open. It's by no means predetermined by great laws of history. Um, in fact, it's a decision taken on a Sunday afternoon by tired and nervous politicians, the majority of whom go into the decisive meetings on the 2nd of August 1914, thinking that Britain will stay out. So one of the things I wanted to try and establish uh, in the book was a that there wasn't a German bid for world power that Germany's motives were in many ways uh, based on a sense of weakness and were directed mainly against Russia and that therefore the German objective was limited to a continental showdown and secondly that the British decision to intervene which I think did turn this continental war into a global war mm -hmm. was on a knife edge and might well have gone the other way. Well, the, the conventional wisdom uh, is that, you know, this was the war to end all wars, and that what Britain was doing was following a pattern of behavior from the imperialist days, which was intervening to stop aggression, aggression that threatened uh, the rampage of, uh, of, of the, the, the continent. You find evidence to the contrary. Well, I think one of the things that's most interesting is the way in which historians always assume that a very great event must have very great causes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I try and do in the book is to analyze the traditional great cause explanations. Was it imperialism, for example, right. as you just suggested? Was this an inevitable confrontation between two or more great imperialist powers, but principally b between Britain and Germany? When you look at the story of relations between Britain and Germany around the globe, the classic imperialist argument begins to flake because it becomes pretty clear that wherever uh, British and German interests came into um, collision, pretty quickly resolution was achieved. That the war in that sense wasn't a war about empires. That, for example, the war that often is uh, uh, imagined over navies, it's very often argued that the First World War is due to the construction of a German navy. Um, this is a, a myth. The, the whole arms race at sea was over by 1912 because the Germans realized that they couldn't compete financially mm -hmm. with Britain's uh, battleship building program. So you gradually go through these great causes and uh, on close inspection uh, they all seem to me to be found wanting. And you're left with this strange residual explanation uh, which was the one the British Foreign Office generally trotted out and it went like this. The tradition of British foreign policy is that no one power should dominate the continent. Uh, that is why we fought against Louis XIV, uh, and that is why we fought against Napoleon, and Kaiser Wilhelm II is clearly the heir to this tradition of would-be continental hegemon, and therefore we must intervene. Now, historical arguments like that can be very seductive, simple, clear analogies that in a way prevent you having to think too deeply about mm -hmm. your options. Uh, it seems to me that this analysis was flawed in two ways. One, it's by no means clear that the Germans did have the kind of uh, Napoleonic uh, design that was being attributed to them. Uh, um, in my mind, the German objectives were amazingly narrow in the sense that they were mainly preoccupied with the decline of the size of their army relative to 
the, 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 the armies of France and Russia. The, the, in many ways, the German preoccupations were uh, stemming from a sense of insecurity. And there just is no plan that one can find until well into the war uh, for a direct threat to British security interests. Mm -hmm. If Britain is going to intervene in a continental conflict, it isn't going to be like the Napoleonic Wars. You aren't going to be able to simply pay the continental states to fight the enemy for a decade or so, and then in a leisurely British fashion intervene when you finally get round to having an army. It, it can't be like that, because mm -hmm. 1914 isn't 1800. It's a serious business fighting the Germans. And my main charge against British policymakers is that first they make a decision it's not a very public decision. In fact, it's a secret decision. We're going to support the French if there's a war. And then they stop. They don't go, and therefore we need to introduce conscription to have an army capable of stopping the Germans. That decision is only taken in August 1914, after the entry into the war. And it takes until 1916 to have a big enough army. And well, even then, it's not a good enough army. And it gets wiped out at the Somme, or nearly. Now, if, uh, if you have a situation here where Britain is intervening only at the 11th hour and not for particularly noble causes, as, as, as you suggest, and that, in fact, it's domestic political concerns that are driving you into the war. What were those? What was the actual impetus for Britain to make the decision? Well, one of the things that really surprised me when I tried to trace the British decision for war in detail was that when it came to the crunch, it wasn't about Belgium as we were taught to think at school. Now, right. usually, the conventional explanation for British intervention in 1914 is that there was this dusty old treaty going back to 1839 that says Belgium is neutral. If any of the powers attacks Belgium, then the other powers have to intervene. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of legal obligation. We don't want to do it, but the law says this, we must do it. And then you look at what they're saying in the cabinet and on the Committee of Imperial Defense where the key decisions are taken. And the first thing that hits you is that Belgium is a pretext, that they're talking about the possibility if the Germans don't go into Belgium, we may have to. That a neutral Belgium could be incompatible with a war against Germany. So there's much more cynicism about Belgium than I had certainly expected. Mm -hmm. uh, then you find how it is that this minority, the Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, and Winston Churchill at the Admiralty, persuade the majority of doubters. I mean, this is a liberal government sliding towards election and defeat. They're all terribly, terribly nervous of anything that might lead to militarism in Britain. How do you persuade this swithering majority to go for intervention? And it turns out that the clinching argument is, of course, says Gray, if we don't intervene, I'll have to resign because, unbeknown to you, I've made these pledges to the French. And if I resign, of course, well, the government will fall and you'll all be out of a job. And one of the ministers even has a letter from his wife saying, Gosh, I hope you aren't going to lose your job at the moment with economic difficulties being what they are. And, and so for, it seems to me, primarily domestic political reasons, to keep their jobs, to keep the Conservatives out of office, these guys decide on war. And in that sense, it's a very frivolous decision. We've all seen the old newsreels of hordes of young men in England enlisting for the First World War, and that, that it has always been assumed that there was a, a patriotic fever that overtook uh, Britain with the decision to, uh, to intervene in, uh, in the continent. You ascribe the motives of uh, a lot of these enlistees to far more pragmatic causes, don't you? There was certainly enthusiasm. I mean, the British case is different from the continental case in the sense that if you were a continental young man, you just mm. called up. Sure. You didn't have any choice. Uh, and we know from evidence that uh, those who were called up, say, in France, didn't all feel enormous euphoria. Uh, there's a great deal of, of despondency and, and, and nervousness. Uh, and that's true also uh, of uh, German cities, for example. I mean, there, there are good studies that have been done on popular opinion in 1914, which really do qualify this idea of euphoria. The British case is, is peculiar because uh, it's an option. It's not something you absolutely sure. have to do. Uh, now, why is it that my grandfather uh, was one of those who rushed to enlist? He was underage and was turned away and had to wait. Uh, and then he did join up as mm -hmm. soon as he possibly could uh, after his 17th birthday. Why? The big question in my mind was why it should be uh, that ordinary men, uh, he's a working class, young Glaswegian, uh, should want to go and fight for, officially, uh, the neutrality of Belgium, which is by no means the kind of cause that uh, one would uh, instinctively expect a young Glaswegian to feel very strongly mm -hmm. about. Uh, 
Uh, now, the conventional answer is that there is a culture of heightened nationalism abroad in Europe, that in some ways education and all kinds of other institutions have combined to, to create a kind of hyper-nationalism and people just can't wait to go out there and they have a naive view that war is a kind of sport and it will all be over by Christmas and so on and so forth. Then you have a, lot, a little look at what in fact goes on and why it is that people join up. And one of the most important surprises uh, I found is that people join up partly because they're out of work. One of the first things the war does is to cause unemployment to zoom up because it's a massive financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the war just causes world capitalism to shut down. For about two or three months, there is complete economic disjunction, and a lot of men are out of work. Uh, and so one explanation, I mean, if you look at the uh, peak of enlistments and the peak of unemployment uh, in Britain, it coincides almost exactly. So there is a prosaic reason why young men might think of doing this. Now, even, even more controversial, I think, in, in the book. I mean, again, we've all been told the, the terrible toll of life, the number of people who were killed in the war. And we have these pictures, you know, from poets and, uh, and writers of the absolutely wretched conditions that uh, soldiers fought in the First uh, World War. Yet you claim that many of these young men came to love the war and point as evidence a uh, take-no-prisoners mentality, revenge killings particularly, pronounced among the Australians and the, and the Scots. Yes, this is one of the things that really surprised me, and I wasn't at all prepared for it. Uh, but the more I read about the war experience, the soldiers' experience, and the more I moved away from the classic war poets like Wilfred Owen, the more I began to see that the war wasn't just a living hell. And when you think about it, it it's, it's slightly hard to explain that the war should last so long. Uh, if it is a living hell, if everybody is going through what Wilfred Owen's poems suggest they're going through. How on earth do these armies keep going? Why doesn't the war simply collapse with mass desertions? In fact, hardly anybody deserts on the Western Front. Uh, there is a remarkably low level of disciplinary difficulty. Uh, and the offensives keep on going. They keep on happening. Uh, and the, in that sense, the problem is to explain not uh, war weariness, or disillusionment, all the classic things that we get from the war poets, but actually the willingness to fight. Now the interesting thing is that when you look hard at uh, the more prosaic records, the diaries and the letters that people wrote, and also the memoirs that nobody reads anymore because they're not, in terms of literature, very good, one of the things that comes out is that there's a cycle of violence on the Western Front. It gets worse rather than better. In 1914 and Christmas, British and German soldiers play football with one another in mm -hmm. no man's land and exchange gifts. That is out of the question by 1916. By 1916, there is too much bad blood. What in fact happens uh, is that one killing leads to another. Once you have seen your mate shot or blown to fragments by, quote, the Bosch or the Hun, uh, you feel pretty mad. And one of the things that I argue is that uh, the revenge motive is one of the strongest reasons why ordinary men uh, don't just keep fighting, but are actually progressively more and more eager uh, to get at the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, and and a a attacks, combat, uh, are in many ways uh, high points uh, for those who survive. Uh, the, the chance to get at the other side uh, and to engage in close combat is quite attractive. If you are feeling hatred. Mm. And hatred is a very strong human emotion, and hatred is abroad in the First World War on an almost unprecedented scale. Now, not only have you uh, created a, a revisionist analysis of what transpired during the, uh, the First World War, but you speculate what might have happened if events had have been uh, uh, otherwise. And among them, you suggest that if uh, Britain hadn't intervened, that uh, the war would have probably been restricted to a, a continental engagement, that Germany would have won, and that at the end of the day, we probably would have had a European common market centered uh, uh, by Germany eight decades before we actually ended up with one. That, to many people, has been probably the most outrageous conclusion that you've drawn. Yes, I confess to having writ written the one sentence which draws a parallel between today's European Union and German war aims in 1914, mm -hmm. fully aware that this would uh, set uh, several cats among the pigeons, uh, perhaps several tigers would be more accurate. Um, it was 
in some ways, deliberately provocative. But I felt that it was necessary to make people realize uh, that on paper, a key German war aim, which would have been entirely compatible with British neutrality, let's in a sense imagine what the Germans would have been aiming for if they had succeeded in keeping Britain out, was the creation of something very like the European Union. Its membership would have been more or less the same. Its structure would have been more or less the same. It would have been a single market. Uh, the Germans even say uh, that there will be no formal German dominance, although in practice we'll dominate it economically. Well, uh, this isn't so very different from uh, the situation today. My point is, what would the world have looked like uh, in 1916 if Britain had stayed uh, aside? There's no question in my mind that the Germans would have won that war. I think that's almost irrefutable because they do effectively wear the French down on the Western Front. And the French, by 1916, without the British Army, would have been defeated. Mm -hmm. They simply would have run out of men. Then you have to ask yourself, well, would that Europe have been a more stable or less stable place than the Europe that emerged in 1918-19? And the consequences that flow from a German victory do seem to me to be, in many ways, preferable to the consequences that flow from a longer war that ends not only in German defeat, but also in the Russian Revolution. Uh, if you imagine the 1916 German victory, it's going to be more like the 1870 victory over France uh, than, uh, let's say, the 1917 uh, victory or the 1918 victory that, that, that happens after a longer war. German names would certainly have included territorial annexations mm -hmm. uh, in Western and, and Eastern Europe. But the creation of a European Union, which is one of the prime objectives, wouldn't have posed, it seems to me, any strategic threat uh, to a neutral Britain. It would only have posed a threat if the Germans had then said, and we're going to build a whole series of naval bases uh, on the Channel Coast. But it's quite hard to show that they would have done that. Well, I wanted to ask you about that, because the justification post Hoke of, uh, 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 of the war was that you know, that Germans aspirations, Germany's aspirations were not simply commercial, that there was a militaristic uh, undertone, and that in fact a value system that found its manifestation in the, in the next 20 years that were quite horrific, and that the First World War was absolutely instrumental in containing those ambitions and those values. Do you, does that doesn't cut much water for you? Well, not really, because it seems to me that um, the fundamental mistake that historians make is to assume that the Germany of 1914 is the Germany of 1939. And this seems to be to misunderstand what National Socialism it actually was. It takes the defeat and then the Versailles Treaty to create the seedbed of National Socialism. If the Germans had won the First World War, and if the First World War had not been a world war but a continental war, what would Adolf Hitler have had to complain about? He would have been able to lead uh, a contented life as a fulfilled veteran of the victorious war, painting mediocre postcards in Munich, and we would never have heard of him. We know from Hitler's own account and from other evidence that the thing that turns Hitler into a political figure is the trauma of defeat, a trauma which instantly, it's quite extraordinary, politicizes him and, and turns a man who had in the pre-war period lived uh, quite peacefully with Jews in Vienna into a virulent anti-Semite, into a an extraordinarily uh, virulent anti-Bolshevik. These are consequences of, of the defeat and the peculiar nature of the German defeat. The fact that it comes like such a bolt from the blue. I, I said earlier that the Germans were the most successful military force in the war, and they were. I mean, they succeed in killing about 35% more men than they lose. Mm -hmm. This is one reason why defeat comes as such a bolt from the blue. That anybody who has, has fought finds it very hard to come to terms with this defeat. And the Germans subsequently are in denial about it. They, they have this myth that Germany was undefeated in the field. Right. All of these are the psychological roots of National Socialism. They would not have existed. If Germany would have won a more, right. uh, a more limited Nor war. Nor would Lenin have been in power in Russia. So imagine a world that... He would have stayed in exile in your... In right. Your, he would have been sitting in hotel rooms predicting the revolution, and it would never have come. Now, on that, I mean, you know the old cliche that, you know, hindsight is, is, uh, is twenty twenty. I mean, how do you justify that kind of, uh, of speculation, you know, kind of leveling blame uh, for, you know, what was a tragic and, uh, and very, very human loss, when at the time, you know, the, the leaders of, uh, of the war, the Allied forces, could have never known the toll that this war was going to take or the length, the duration. They certainly didn't enter the war on the assu that assumption, I can't believe.
Well, this is a, a myth. I mean, there's a myth that, that, that says everybody thought the war would be short, good mm -hmm. fun, like a sort of extended game of cricket, and, and they would all have been home by Christmas. Um, well, if anybody thought that, they must have been almost wholly oblivious uh, to every war that had been fought in the preceding 50 years, in which war after war, including the American Civil War and then the Russo-Japanese War, sees an escalation of the destructive capability uh, of conventional forces. Uh, and we know from the kind of plans and studies that went on in the German general staff, even within the British military, there was a clear awareness that a, a war between the great powers in 1914 would be a cataclysm. W were they aware of how much technology was going to change that war? Absolutely. They Absolutely. were. Because that, again, is the assumption. They the, could have no idea. In 1898, a man named Ivan Bloch had published a book which uh, was published in English under the very misleading title, Is War Now Impossible? That book says with complete accuracy what the implications are of machine guns, of barbed wire, of trench warfare, and it predicts that a war between the great powers will be suicidal for, for at least some of those great powers, will lead ultimately to social revolution because its costs in terms of life and money will be so great. And that's 1898. Uh, so the, there's uh, more than a decade uh, for uh, the generals and the military planners to get their heads around the technological implications of a great power war. And it's fascinating how uh, within the German general staff the internal discussions are all about not how can we be in the Champs-Élysées for December 1914, but how far can we get into French territory in the first phase of the war so that in the subsequent siege warfare we will be in the stronger position. We will be able to take the defensive. So they knew uh, and I think uh, even the diplomats knew. In, 18, uh, in 1914, Sir Edward Grey keeps saying uh, to the Russian Foreign Minister, Sazonov, do you realize if there is a war, it will be like the 1848 revolutions. Uh, the whole of Europe will be plunged into chaos. Nobody in any decision-making position had any illusions about the scale of what they were getting into. And to try to say it's only with the benefit of hindsight we know that it was going to be a revolutionary total war it's just giving these guys far too much of the benefit of the doubt. Now, while it's a bit of a cheeky question, I mean, we're talking about something that happened 80 years ago. Why have no other historians come to the conclusions that you have? Well, the obvious answer is that if, if they had, I, I wouldn't have bothered writing the book because there would have been no point. Mm -hmm. The less obvious answer is that a lot of the literature that was pub published in Germany between the wars uh, did emphasize uh, the nearness of the miss, if you like, the, the proximity of a German victory. And there was an enormous analysis of mm -hmm. what we did wrong. Sure. How can we learn from this? Uh, and although it's usual to dismiss this kind of, of literature as special pleading by nationalist historians, in many ways it was the right question to ask. I mean, the extent of German military success uh, did beg the question, well, why did we ultimately lose? Uh, and from that point of view, I haven't entirely been uh, conjuring this idea out of the air. Uh, but I think my motivation has been to challenge some very, very strongly held assumptions. Uh, a, that the war is a terrible human tragedy, a, a, a pathetic story uh, of misery and suffering, and B, that it's inevitable. And I do think that what the book is partly doing is taking a lot of quite disparate and obscure research uh, by military historians, by economic historians, the kind of books that, frankly, not many people get around to reading, bringing it together and presenting a synthesis of newer research. It's not a one-man band. The historical enterprise is a collective one. Mm -hmm. uh, and my bibliography is a kind of, it's a hit list of some absolutely fascinating books, uh, which when you put them together, really do alter our interpretation, show that the war was not a horrific experience for every individual, that horrifically many individuals, not least Hitler, found it the most fulfilling experience of their lives and shows also that uh, this event was not inevitable, that well, it could have had different outcomes. Now, you support the conclusion that this could very well have been the biggest blunder in, uh, in all of history by asking the very simple question, what was accomplished? It certainly didn't achieve peace. Twenty years later, we're into uh, another war. Britain is in, in the decline. Yet, if you look at the history of the 20th century, I mean, it is an inexorable march towards progressively more prosperity and progressively more democracy. How do we know that it wasn't the war, and, and the First World War in particular, that starts that march? Well, I think the only way of portraying the 20th century as an upward progressive sweep uh, 
is to ignore more or less everything that happens between around 1914 and 1989, uh, to view the world uh, from the vantage point uh, of North America uh, uh, in the year 2000. Uh, the reality is that the 20th century is uh, an astonishing century of slaughter uh, in which millions, almost incalculable millions of people, uh, fall victim uh, to politically motivated murder. Uh, and 1914 is the point, really, at which this process begins. And it isn't really over until the collapse of communism uh, in 1989 to 91. That's the story of the 20th century. Now, The Pity of War appears to be uh, inspired by an earlier book that, uh, that you wrote, Virtual History, where you set out um, a number of counterfactual scenarios and asked the question, which obviously is some fun, what if, how would history be altered? What can we learn from that approach to history? How is that a beneficial exercise for us to go through? Well, virtual history was a manifesto, really, uh, which said uh, in the introduction that it's not just fun to ask what-if questions about the past. It's absolutely necessary. And, in fact, most historians do it. They just don't do it explicitly. Mm -hmm. uh, and my key argument was that anything you say which is about causation, about the causes of an event, has to be testable with the what-if question. Now, let me illustrate what I mean with a concrete example. Suppose you hold to the view that Adolf Hitler is the cause of the Second World War, sure. that it is primarily a consequence of his ideology and his power in Germany. Uh, many books will tell you this. Uh, the, this kind of statement is quite common. And yet none of them will then say, uh, and to prove this point, let's simply imagine a Germany without Hitler. Uh, take another example. It's very widely believed that Hitler would never have come to power in Germany if there hadn't been a Great Depression. And this is often asserted. The cause of the rise of the Nazi Party was the 1929 Wall Street crash and the Great Depression. Well, that's a statement which is uh, an assertion, uh, and no more than an assertion, until you put it to some kind of rigorous test. And the test, to my mind, is would German politics have been different if the German economy hadn't collapsed? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's far from clear. Because some economies, which suffered just as badly as Germany's in the Great Depression, didn't produce fascism. The United States didn't produce fascism, and it had a depression just as deep as Germany's. So my, um, in many ways, my most fundamental belief about history as a discipline is that we must ask what-if questions, that we actually can't say anything meaningful about the past until we, until we do. Uh, it's a way of testing our assumptions, making explicit the theories that, that, that are lurking there between the lines.